Good morning. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to your Father's house. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, thank you for gathering us together this morning. Many of us in this sanctuary, many others watching and listening online at this hour and later on throughout the week. Thank you, God, for the way that you call your people to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we ask that the praises we sing, the prayers we pray, the message we hear, the fellowship we enjoy, the service you compel us to do, will bring glory to you and will bring joy to our hearts. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you'd please look in your bulletin at the little half sheet. We've got two important things that are happening uh, this week. First of all, uh, we have PDO Open House. And sometimes in the church we use lots of acronyms and abbreviations like you might hear in the military. PDO is our Parents' Day Out. So it's a ministry we have. It's a Christian preschool. And they have their open house from 5 to 7. If you're interested in your child or your grandchild being a part of it, call the church office and we'll see if we can get them registered. And then next week we'll begin our wonderful Wednesday meals again and all the activities that we do on Wednesday nights. Uh, we start with a meal, then we have Bible studies, children's activities, uh, youth activities, adult Bible studies, the music uh, groups rehearse, so it's a, a wonderful time on Wednesday night. If you hadn't been going this past semester, start going this next semester and you'll love it. Ronnie Billings uh, is in the hospital. When the bulletin was printed, uh, he had, was not yet in the hospital. I get word this morning that he is much better and hopefully will come home. And then my wife Renee and I would like to announce that our youngest son, uh, Josh, and his girlfriend, Lauren, got engaged last night. And uh, he, he said when they were first talking to us about it, he said, uh, well, we thought we might ask John, that's our older son who's a minister also, to perform the wedding, but we thought it would hurt your feelings. And I said, yeah, it would. <laughs> So I get to officiate. It won't be at church. It's going to be a, kind of an outdoor venue in March. Uh, but John Knox will get to be a groomsman, but the old man will get to officiate, and I'm looking forward to it. So we're so glad to have Lauren and our family. Let's continue our worship. Good morning. It's fantastic to see you all here this morning. Uh, please stand with us. We're going to be seeing your graces enough. And... Uh, you know, we've been going through the series of Ephesians, and of course, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says it, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It, this is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so none of us can brag about it. And uh, when we're singing this morning, I just want you to understand that grace is something it's God, give, God has given us that we do not deserve. So remember 
to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 59. O Lord, I will sing of your strength. For you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. Let's continue singing together and we'll sing God of Wonders. Charles Dunstan's one of our ruling elders, and she's going to hit the high points on the elders' notes.
Thank you, Pastor Tim. Um, we've uh, accepted the resignation of Donald Miller as our organist. So if you all, I mean, if I, not organist, I guitar. So if you all know of anyone, <laughs> so if you all know of anyone that would like to fill that uh, position, please let Tim know or please let Lynn know because I think she's in charge of the worship committee. On Sunday the 12th, we're going to have a joint worship service with Grace Bible Church. They're the ones that use our, our facilities on Sunday night. So I want to let you all know, start your ready for another potluck because we love having our potluck dinners. Um, if you did not get this in the mail, please look for it. It's a per asking uh, we, uh, envelope for you to put money in for us to have the e EPC ask us to do this every year and I don't think it was in the bulletin today so we will ask that you will please fill this out and please continue to pray, pray for Pastor Tim. <laughs> All right, let's bow our heads and let's pray together. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, so holy. God, help us to pay attention to your wonders in this life. Thank you, God, that at the early service this morning, we saw a dad who's been stuck in Mongolia for many, many months walk in with his family. Thank you, God, for your wonders for bringing a mob back to his family, back to his church family. God of wonders, there are so many wonders in this life. When a son gets engaged, when a baby is born, when someone dies and goes to heaven, when a family realizes that they need the church and the church needs them, when someone gets good news about a job, or perhaps even when someone loses one job because you want them to be somewhere else. When we get a diagnosis from a doctor and find out that there's a way for a person to get well. And even when a believer leaves this life, thank you for the wonder that you give us of memory and the way we want to carry on that kind of love as an extension of that person in our lives. God of wonders. We confess also that we're not holy. You are and we're not. And so thank you for making us a way to be reconciled to you and to one another. We thank you for the wonder that is forgiveness, that is grace. Many of us have come here this morning with concerns and burdens, with joys, with things we want to share, and with things we need help with. Thank you for drawing us into your presence. May this be a week in which we not only see your wonders, but acknowledge them and tell somebody about them. As Russell said before the singing, faith is a gift, it's by grace so that we won't boast. May we boast only in you and what you've done for us. God, please take care of our nation. We admit and we know that we're adrift. Help us not just to be those who complain. Help us to do less of that and more of digging down deep and doing our part that this nation will once again be a city set on a hill, a light to the other nations. Forgive us and change us. And always we pray you would be with those on watch, police officers, firefighters, paramedics, sheriff's deputies, Service members, the list goes on and on. Nurses, doctors, please, God, be with those on watch. And would you hear us now as we pray together the prayer taught to us by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. send y'all to the Grand Old Opera. You're awesome. Let's stand. Let's say what we believe together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the one holy and universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Miss Carolyn. You may be seated. All right, darling, thank you for bringing your offering. All right, Hannah and Faith and Levi, I want you to look at this big old Bible. Now, last Sunday we talked about it. It's really heavy. It's an old Bible that's been in a family in our church for a long time, over 100 years. And so since our church is 100 years old, I wanted us to do some things that we can look at some things we can learn from this old Bible. So last Sunday we looked at a picture of an insect that's in the Bible. Do you remember what it was? They make a loud sound at night. Cicada. Cicada, that's right, the locust, that's right. Well, now we're going to look at lions. Let me come down one more step. Lion? Yeah, let's look at this lion. All right, look, Faith, see the picture of this lion right here? See him? The big old lion. What sound does a lion make? Wow. Yeah, sometimes it's a little louder than that, isn't it? Listen up. <laughs> Man. Lions are scary sometimes, aren't they? Well, you know, the lion is the king. Was weird about the lion. Who did, baby? Well, the lion is the king of the jungle. And back when the Bible was written, there were lions in Israel. There were actually lions there. There aren't any now, but there used to be. A crocodile. A crocodile, that's right, baby. Well, here's the lion, and you can see a lion at the zoo. And when you watch a movie sometimes, the lion that's at the first part of the movie, he was actually a lion from the Memphis Zoo a long time ago. That's pretty cool. Well, anyway, what I want to tell you about the lion is that in the Bible, God says that Jesus is like a lion. So he's really fierce rah, when he's after the devil. He'll get him. But he's also gentle like the lion in the Narnia stories. And maybe you've seen some of those movies or you're reading some of those books because Aslan, when he's supposed to be like Jesus, you can just pet Aslan. He's gentle. You can walk up to him and just pet him like you could pet a lion's mane. So Jesus sometimes is really fierce. Let's hear that one more time, Jason. When he's after the devil. He's fierce. But when he's dealing with us, he's gentle. He loves us. You can pet his mane. All right. Next week, we'll see what we're going to look at. We'll keep looking at some animals and insects that are in the Bible. We'll look at the old pictures in this one. Sound like a plan? All right. Put your hands together and close your eyes. And we'll say, Father, I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Noticed how excited Hannah was to put her offering in the offering plate. The Bible says very often, a little child shall lead them. May we be just as excited about being a part of what God's doing in and through this old church. Amen. Let's give our tithes and our offerings.
Pray with me, please. Father, we found such treasures in your amazing love. As we're about to read in Ephesians, the immeasurable riches of your great love for us. Thank you, Father, for continuing to put on our hearts the desire to give because you're a giving God. Please accept these offerings these tithes, may they be used to continue in a very real and tangible and stronger way the ministry and the mission of this old church. We thank you for a hundred years that you've given us. And unless you come again, give us a hundred and then a hundred until you return and take your people home. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. How many of you like a good mystery? You like to read a good mystery? You like to watch a good mystery? That's why we continue to like Sherlock Holmes and the newer versions of Sherlock Holmes. That's why my wife loves NCIS, you know, the whodunit. Well, Paul is going to talk in Ephesians 
in this third chapter about a mystery, and it is a good mystery that God has solved. He's told us how He's going to reconcile us to Himself and to one another. It's through Jesus. And there's a prophecy about how God solves this mystery. It's in chapter 2 of Zechariah's gospel. Excuse me, Zechariah's prophecy. It's verses 10 through 11. Let's listen. Shout and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for I am coming, and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you, and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. And then let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. We'll read verses 1 through 13. Keep in mind, of course, that this is a letter of Paul. Paul addressed it to the Christians in Ephesus, and then it was sent out to other churches as well in Asia Minor, what we call Turkey today. And Paul's going to do something that he pretty regularly does. He's going to start out with a thought, and then something else comes in his mind, and he goes in kind of on a rabbit trail. And it's a rabbit trail about the mystery of why God loves unlovable people. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, and then he starts his rabbit trail, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it is now being revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things." His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to His eternal purpose, which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Him, and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. It's God's Word. It's just as real and applicable today as it was when it was written almost 2,000 years ago. Let's pray together. Master, help me to make plain your love for us and for all who name Christ as Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you about a distinctive. The distinctive is Jesus Christ. Jesus is distinctly different as the leader of a religion than any other leader of any other religion before, now, or to come. And then I want to talk about the fact that there are no distinctions among people who love Jesus and how that leads us to the communion table and what it means for us when we go out of the church's doors. So first of all, let's talk about the distinctive that is Jesus Christ. As a military chaplain, I routinely ask service members a straightforward question. Are you a person of faith? I'm discreet about it. I don't do it in front of other Marines or sailors or if I happen to be with soldiers or airmen or Coast Guardians. 
I don't want to put them off, and I don't want to embarrass them either. But I asked that very straightforward question, are you a person of faith? I did a lot of it this past week when I was with a group of Marines, Sunday night through Wednesday afternoon. Usually the answer is yes. Yes, chaplain. Yes, sir. But there's almost always a caveat these days, a caveat that breaks my heart. Yes, I believe in God, but I don't believe in organized religion. Now, why do people say that so much today? What's going on? Well, part of it is that the social media and all the other media outlets that we have are fighting a spiritual battle to keep people out of church. The devil's behind it. He's good at what he does, but God is better at what he does. I think people often say, but, but I don't want to have anything to do with the church because they don't understand the church. And because they believe, as is true for many American things, that we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we're going to get there and we'll do it ourselves, by ourselves. And they don't understand, because maybe they haven't been taught, that you have to have Jesus and the church together. You can't be a Christian without other Christians. The Bible doesn't teach in any place that there's anything as a Lone Ranger Christian. That's why in other settings outside the military, when people are asked if they believe in God, most people say yes. But when asked if they go to church, most people say no. It didn't used to be that way in this country. Church attendance used to be about 60% of the nation. It's dipped below 50% now. And that breaks my heart, and I hope it breaks yours. One of the reasons there is often this disconnect between faith and practice is ignorance about Christianity. Now, ignorance is not stupidity. My grandfather used to say, there ain't no excuse for stupidity, no remedy for it. But I'm talking about ignorance when people just simply don't know. And they don't know because we're not sharing it with them. We've got to be willing to say, yeah, I love my church. The people are great. The music is wonderful. We do all kinds of things together that we couldn't do individually. Preacher, he's a little sketchy, but I love my church. You're supposed to laugh at that. Many think of Christianity as a mystery. They think, I just don't know what people do in church. And, and I, don't know, I don't know about all these rules. and eh, I don't want people telling me what to do. I get all that at work and at school. Eh, I don't think I want to have anything to do with Christianity. Christianity is about what God has done for us. It's not what we know or what we do, it's what He's done for us. Christianity is a breath of fresh air to us and to everyone. Paul wrote that his goal in Ephesians 3, and the goal of every Christian should be to make plain to everyone the mystery that Gentiles and Jews share together in the promise of Christ Jesus. In other words, what Paul is saying is it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter what you look like, the color of your skin, how much money you make or don't make, when you live, none of that matters to God. What matters to God is faith. And He's given it to so many all down through the ages. And what we need most in this nation now is not money, it's not another program, it's faith. And God, in a mysterious way, will answer our prayers to give more people faith. The Christian faith, then, is distinctive from all other religions because of Christ. I want you to think for a minute about the symbols of all the other major religions. The symbol of Christianity is the cross. 
the sacrificial cross Jesus died on. God died for us. It's like today having an electric chair or a syringe as the symbol of our faith. A syringe with medicine, poison to kill you. But what are the symbols of the other religions? Well, you've got the moon, the crescent moon for Islam. You've got the Star of David for Judaism. You have that strange little symbol of Hinduism. It's like a symbol of the universe. None of that is about sacrificial love. None of it. It is Jesus, His death, His resurrection that distinguishes Christianity from every other faith group. We're the only religion that has the good news of a God who loves us so much He gave Himself for us. The followers of Protestantism, Catholicism, all the Orthodox Christians, all of us believe in, now listen to me, we believe in the cat doctrine of salvation. What God does for us. If you've been around me any amount of time, you've probably heard me use this analogy. first learned it from a Presbyterian pastor years ago named Ben Lacey Rose. How does a mama cat move her kittens from one location to another. She comes up to them and she bites them gently by the nape of their neck and she moves them. And that's the way God moves us from earth to heaven and from everything going on in this life to the next thing. God does it. He takes care of us. The Lion of Judah, the ferocious lion who defeats the devil, comes and gently picks us up and moves us, and does not let go of us. That's what Christians believe. It's not what we know, it's not what we do, it's what God has done for us. But the followers of all other religions, all of them, those in the past, those now, and those to come, the followers of all other religions believe in the monkey doctrine of salvation. And Dr. Rose used to say, how does a mama monkey move her young in the jungle? She doesn't move them. They just have to hold on for dear life as she swings through the trees to the next tree. And if they fall off, psh, like wily e. Coyote, they're gone. So many people believe that it's what they have to do. They have to hold on to God. They have to hold on to what they know or what they've done or what they haven't done. And maybe, just maybe, if they hold on, they'll get to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. Thank God the Bible teaches that God holds on to us. That's why Paul says the mystery is solved. Because of the administration of God's grace that was given to him for the Gentiles, Paul was glad to be a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And he launches in to all this discussion about there being no distinctions in Christ, nothing to separate us. He's talking here about the Gentiles. Now, who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles is us. Anyone who doesn't have a Jewish mother. All through the Old Testament, God had reached out to Gentiles and Jews. But the Jews were exclusive and they felt like they were the only ones. And Paul, as a Jew, is saying, uh-uh. God is giving faith to everyone. In essence, Paul was under house arrest in Rome because God had revealed to him the mystery of Christ. He was there because the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem were about to kill him and he appealed to Caesar and he gets to Rome because he's a Roman subject also, a Roman citizen. And while he's there, he puts out all kinds of wonderful words of wisdom. Now, as I said earlier about mysteries, we like to read a mystery because we want to know who done it. We like to see what it's about. And God in His mercy is allowing us to see what this life is all about. This mystery we call life, it's much better than NCIS, better than Sherlock Holmes, all of that. The mystery of life is that God loves us through Jesus. In Paul's day and in ours, there were many mystery religions. 
So part of the background for what Paul says here is that he lived in a time like we do when there are mystery religions. When every group that's in one of those categories had its own particular secret rites. The mysteries were not shared with anyone else outside the temple or the lodge. They had a secret handshake. If you knew the handshake, you could come in. If you knew the password, you could come in. If you knew if you'd memorized the formula, you knew it here, you could come in, but nobody else could. Kind of like in the Little Rascals, if you remember the He-Man Women Haters Club, wouldn't let the girls in. How different it is with Christianity. We're in because God brought us in. We're part of the family of faith because God gave us the gift. There are no secret rituals in this church or in any Christian church. When someone's baptized, it's public. Good grief, our stuff is going out on Facebook now all over the world. If you look at the thread, it's amazing. There's no secret here. How do you become a Christian? You profess faith. What do we believe? It's up on the screen. It's in the bulletin. The Apostles' Creed. The Bible. Nothing secret. Nothing secret. So in sharp contrast to these mystery religions, God had revealed in His Word that He had always given faith to both Jew and Gentile. And Jew and Gentile in the Bible is shorthand for everybody. Though God had directed His love primarily toward the Jews, He had always loved Gentiles as well. In the Old Testament, you have Gentiles like Rahab, right? You have Gentiles like Ruth. Many nations will be joined with the Lord on that day, declares the Lord, and will become my people through Christ. And Paul was given the privilege of preaching the mystery of the unsearchable riches of Christ. What are some of those riches? Forgiveness. How unsearchable is that? The God of the universe forgives me for all the things I've done and didn't do that I should have done, the things that I've thought that were wrong, the things that I should have thought that I didn't think. God forgives you as well. How unsearchable is that? And because you're forgiven and I'm forgiven, we're given the ability and the desire to forgive others. The unsearchable riches of Christ. God's grace is the opposite of a lot of what we're hearing right now in our culture. Ideologies like CRT, critical race theory. Now hear me out on this. God's grace is the opposite of that. In Christ alone, all the things that divide people, all of those things are removed. And I saw a tangible example of this yesterday downtown. We were downtown because we knew Josh was going to propose to his girlfriend. So I'd had to park pretty far away from where we ate. I was going back to get my car. I walked past a park I didn't even know was there on 2nd Street, Martin Luther King Park. It had some pictures, some visuals of Martin Luther King, his dream that in all people God worked. It didn't matter if you were green or white or black or blue, whatever. God loves you through Jesus. A dream that, by the way, has pretty much been realized in this nation already. Not always, but almost always. And so as I looked at that, I didn't even know it was there. I'm going to get the car. Then there was a man standing at the corner of Beale and Second, and he had some placards. And his placard said, Jesus is black, the devil is a white man. And that made me sad. And it made me mad. Because lots of people who don't yet know Jesus see that and think, yeah, no wonder I don't want to go to church. I don't want any part of that. I don't want any part of Christianity. Those kinds of things divide people. The gospel unites people. No, the devil is not a white man. No, Jesus was not black. Jesus was a Jew. Jesus is God incarnate. 
And He loves people regardless of what they look like or where they live or what they've done or haven't done. The gospel is about reconciliation. It's about grace. That's why Paul wrote, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. All of those distinctions are gone because you're one in Christ Jesus. Which leads us to this table. In Christ and through faith in Him, we may approach God, don't miss this, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. We're going to come to this table not because of what we've done, not because of the color of our skin or anything else, but what God has done for us. We have the freedom to know that we're forgiven. And in this life, if you really reflect on your sins, there is such joy in knowing you're forgiven. And we come with confidence. We don't hesitatingly come and think, well, maybe I'll take a cup of bread. Maybe I'll take a cup. Oh, I don't know if I'll take that juice. I'm not sure. Yes, we're sure. If God has given us the gift of faith, we are more than sure that we're loved when we're unlovable. That's why Paul writes later on in Corinthians, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. The symbol of Christianity is the cross, God's sacrificial love for us. Who may come to the Lord's table in a Presbyterian church? All who believe. That is a treasure and essential of our faith that I long to share with others. You come to this table if you believe in Jesus. He loves you. And maybe this is the first time you've ever come to the Lord's table. Perhaps you've come many, many times as I have. May it be a little different for you this time. Treasure the distinct that, that is Jesus. And know that there are no distinctions among those who name Him as Savior. Which leads me to the old, old story. We're going to sing one of my favorite hymns as our last song after communion. God has enabled us to solve the mystery of life. Better than any NCIS team, better than Sherlock Holmes, God in His mercy through Christ has said, I love unlovable people and I want you to love me back and love other unlovable people. For so many, it's a mystery they don't know how to solve. Jesus solved it. God's eternal purpose, Paul writes, was accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that's why he can say at the end of this section that in spite of his sufferings, he loved to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Since it satisfies our longings as nothing else can do, are we telling others the old, old story? So many need to hear it. You need to hear it. I need to hear it. So many have not yet heard. Will you share it? Will you? Let's bow our heads. Oh God, there's so much noise in our world right now. We sometimes don't know what to believe. But we do believe that you're God, that you're a God of wonders, that in spite of ourselves, we're loved by you. In our mind's eyes, we come to the Lord's table. May we see you sharing and transforming the Passover meal into a meal about your death and resurrection. May we see you go down the steps of the upper room and head out toward the Garden of Gethsemane 
And then later on, led out to your cross. Help us not to take for granted our salvation, nor the salvation of others. And use us, we beg, that many, many more through our lives and the ministry of this church will know that they're forgiven and freed. In Jesus' name, amen. Would the elders serving the Lord's Supper please come to the table? <clears throat> On the first Sunday of every month, we have the Lord's Supper, and I ask Jason to raise the screen, which I love and appreciate, so that we can see something else that we love and appreciate, this old stained glass window moved from our old church. It's a reminder to me that we are a blend of old and new, hopefully the best of the old and the best of the new. And as we come to the table, as we're continuing for a time to come forward for communion on the first Sunday, I'd like to remind you or perhaps tell you for the first time that you will be asked by an elder to come to the front. Another elder will be holding uh, one of these uh, serving, I can't even think what it's called, man, tray, serving tray. And you'll see a cup of bread, take one of those, and a cup of juice. And it is a little awkward, so what I've noticed some people doing is taking the bread cup and the juice cup and doing this and walking back to their seat. So you'll come down the center aisle and you'll go out the front and then go down the outer aisle so that you can sit down and reflect for a few moments. One of the things that we ought to treasure about Presbyterian Communion is the reflection time. When you sit there and you think about what God through Jesus did for you and then you're suddenly aware and for the people around you. Let's bow our heads. Oh God, please sanctify these elements of bread and the fruit of the vine, to that spiritual use to which you have ordained them, that we, your people gathered here, like so many millions gathered in churches all over the world, will know, will sense, will be changed because of your unsearchable riches of grace. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible tells us that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And it would have been a flat piece of bread, an unleavened piece of bread like this. And he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. As I, ministering in his name, give this bread to you. And he told them that evening in the upper room, this bread is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread... And drink this cup. Is it just two elders up here? Okay, my bad. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And then Jesus took the cup, and it would have been a goblet, not a beautiful brass goblet like this, but it would have been a goblet probably terracotta. And Jesus said this cup filled with wine was the New Testament in his blood, shed for many. It is too? Okay. For the remission of sins. Jesus told them that night what he's telling us today. Do this in remembrance of me.
Let's all taste and see that the Lord is good. And likewise, let's all taste and see that the Lord is good in shedding His blood for us. Let's pray together. Oh God, out on our church sign is a new message. Thank you for helping us find it. Soul food served here with an image of the cross. We're grateful to live in a part of the world where we have fried chicken and smothered pork chops and gravy and macaroni and cheese and turnip greens and all that good soul food. But how much more grateful are we to be a part of a community of faith where the sole food of communion is served. May the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ permeate our very souls, so much so that we never ever forget that we're forgiven, so much so that we want others to know that joy as well. In your name, Amen.
It is an old, old story. It will quench your thirst and satisfy your hunger. And somebody you know needs to hear it. You've been fed. I've been fed. My thirst has been quenched, as has yours, with God's amazing grace. If you're finding that to be true as you're a part of this church, then I'd like to talk to you about becoming an official part of this church. We'll welcome you with open arms. Now may God's grace, His mercy, His peace be with you and those you love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.